Um, hello, everybody. Um, this is uh, Santosh Kaveti. I'm a, a CEO and founder of uh, a technology company called ProArc, uh, and also uh, an investor in a sustainability company called Mandra. too many perspectives you know if you look at the food market and if you it's it's food market and as well as retail market it's supposed to be 11.7 trillion dollars and growing you know at the CAGR of five percent and in spite of that we have we have way too many challenges to deal with food security being one of them food shortage being one of them climate change and our carbon goals or sustainability goals. Just in US, if you look at it, you know, there is about $160 billion worth of food that go that goes waste in one of the wealthiest nations. So you do have in, in fact the, the problem magnifies in the post COVID world. So how do we deal with this complex situation and, and a lot of food wastage across the supply chain and, and everybody thinks it's it's at the consumption phase you'll be surprised to hear that actually only 10 percent or less is wasted on the consumption phase and a lot of it is wasted before the consumption phase during the supply chain so we have we have we have um challenges as these but in on top of this how do we fix the circular economy, change the behaviors of all the stakeholders, put the purpose before the profit or with the profit and, and drive the food economy in the right direction. How can we leverage entrepreneurship, technology and innovation to make a difference and meet our sustainability goals? And that's what you know. I, I would like for us to focus on here. With that said, um, Diana, can you please uh, introduce yourselves and, and share your thoughts on this? Yeah, thank you very much, Santos, and um, th thank you, uh, my fellow panelists. Um, so my name is Diana Sabrin. I'm the CEO and co-founder of OneAgrix. And OneAgrix is a digital agricultural and halal ecosystem with supply chain solution. What we do is we empower trust and transparency in an e B2B e-commerce environment. And um, what, what we solve... Um, in the in the agricultural and halal food supply chain is the lack of trust and transparency that's happening right now, especially when um, with um, the onset of COVID nineteen pandemic. Now, so um, so would you like the rest to introduce themselves, or you want all of us to to introduce and give our thoughts on the topic first? No, please go ahead and give your thoughts. You know, and and take a few minutes to give your thoughts, and then I'll move on to Natalia and then to to Constantine. Yes. So so how we view um, before we could fix the the global food chain. Now we need to look at how the food pillar is. So it, at Form One Agrix, we look at the food system in these five food pillars. So we look at it as a food authenticity, food security, food safety, food defense, and food authenticity. And that what, what that really means um, for in a food safety perspective is, is the, will this food make me ill? That's one. In food security, um, do I have enough food to eat? And then obviously, it's, it, we, we are not only talking about consumers here. We are also talking about governments and we're talking about communities. And then when you talk about food authenticity, is anyone um, here to cheat me? Um, and then when you talk about um, food, um, wait, apologies, um, you talk about food um authenticity, safety, um, food defense, we talk about it, would people kill me for food. So this is how we view um, fixing the global food chain in these five pillars. So this is how we view the global food supply chain um, and how we solve it. It has to be in a collaborative perspective. And um, there is no one company in the world that could solve this issue. And if you talk about Santos, just now you talk about um, how in the United States of America, there's a lot of food wastage and it's at the start of the supply chain. And that is true when COVID-19 um, at its height uh, early this year, um, what happened was you see, um, sorry, last year, what you see was lots of potatoes being uh, thrown away 
and they could not be sold. And then people people start asking, is it a distribution issue? Well, yes, can be, but it is also a regulatory issue. issue. And and so this is um, one some of the, the issues that we face in the global um, supply chain and how do we fix them? So it is not merely connecting buyers and suppliers together to help those potato farmers. You also have to look at the regulatory requirement. Um, do, are they allowed to sell um, at, at the very start of the of the food chain? Uh, would there be food safety um, um, issues there? Then um, if you talk about food security issues, now a lot of governments, they view food security as a macro perspective. And um, and, and United States of America, and, and, and why I say US now, because obviously this meeting is spotlighted you know, for the US, um, including themselves, right? Um, how about communities which are faith-based, kosher, halal, um, or gluten-free, vegan, those um, people also has the uh, has a threat of being food insecure. Now, give you an example of an, in, in Canada. Um, in Canada, what happened was um, one of the largest beef, kosher beef supplier, was stripped off his license. So Canada, as you know, is one of the most food secure countries in the world. But then, are they really food secure? The answer is no, because what happened to the kosher, the, the Jewish community in, in, in Canada when the largest beef, um, kosher beef producer get, gets stripped of the license? So, so this is the things that we, we also need to fix, um, not only at the macro level, but at the micro level as well. So it's a lot of mindset shift here, a lot of awareness that people need to know that fixing the global food chain, feeding billions of people requires us to also look at communities. So um, I think that's my 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 initial thoughts, and I would pass over to my other panelists. Thank you, Diana. Uh, Natalia, over to you, please. Thank you, Santa. Good afternoon, good afternoon, distinguished panelists. I'm really pleased to be here. for uh, really actionable opinions and uh, uh, action plans we can go and implement our markets. Uh, I'm a co-founder of Bright Ventures, a non-profit organization advancing women-led entrepreneurship on a mission to change the stereotype of entrepreneurship by advancing women-led startups. I've been deeply involved in the food space. I worked for a decade in AB InBev in different parts of the world, and um, I was instrumental to contribute to the CSR target. I'm currently an investment professional. Uh, I work in VC uh, here in Russia, in a state fund. My task is to develop the projects uh, in the internet. And uh, I focus a lot on the food and agri-tech projects as uh, advisor to the startups. And uh, I also work as independent director, a mid-sized food manufacturer here in Russia. So as a, and as a person with an operational experience in food and um, agri-tech and food supply chains, I strongly believe into the key role of entrepreneurship, which will be the a building block, very important building block in the pandemic recovery and in fixing uh, a global food chain in a post-pandemic world uh, in facing the present uh, the food industry uh, is, uh, uh, is facing today. As a co-founder of Bright Ventures, I'm an absolute believer that women entrepreneurs will play a role in uh, GDP growth in the post-pandemic world and also in uh, solving the world food problems. Why? Because women have been so much involved in agriculture, in food production, in all geographies. And uh, when we as venture capitalists invest to women in food tech and, and Agritech, we invest not only to an entrepreneur, we invest to the families and we invest to the community. And uh, I'm absolutely supporting Diana, who mentioned 
the role of communities in the future food chains. And I, I think we will talk about it more. But uh, my view on that is um, the world had um, gone from a lot from uh, global to local uh, in the containment phase of the pandemic. But to continue the development and to ensure the sustainability and uh, the stability of the food supply chains, I think it's important to keep the cross-border collaborations and ensure that there are toolkits and practices which uh, developed markets share with and big markets share with smaller markets to ensure that we are all in line, we're going at the same speed uh, and uh, that we're really on the cutting edge of the technology, embracing it, because pandemic helped us to realize how technology. Uh, oh, Santosh, over to the next panelist. Thank you so much, Natalia. Um, Konstantin, over to you. Uh, thank you, Santosh. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Konstantin. I'm founder and CEO of a Swiss company, which focuses on uh, mass consumer products in food. And uh, our main ingredient is hemp and cannabis, and we're a vertically integrated company. So, which means actually I have uh, access, I have knowledge to all food supply chains from seed to a final product. And um, so far, we are one of the biggest producers of um, hemp extraction in Europe. And we also have projects in Switzerland, uh, in Eastern Europe, uh, in Russia, in a lot of countries. So uh, I see the industry and I understand, uh, you know, what's going on. And of course, uh, like all the questions which have been addressed uh, by other panelists, they are valid and they are important. But I would like to add uh, one more aspect to this, uh, and in particular, uh, some fundamental things. Uh, and it could sound a little bit, uh, let's say, controversial or even probably a little bit provocative, but I believe when we look at all supply chain uh, for the food, uh, we have fundamental uh, disbalance between, let's say, the price of the food and uh, the money which are uh, distributed to food producers comparing to other items in a consumer basket, for example. And if, even if we look at specific price of the food, we'll see that producers they usually receive the minority of the final price of the product, be it either a processed product or raw product. Uh, and this creates a very interesting topic because I think that this disbalance is addressing a lot of issues connected with food waste, connected with enough money in the system to introduce technologies, connected with food safety, connected with communities, and so forth. And uh, because of that, also, we can see that farmers, they are like, extremely regulated, and the uh, majority of farmers, they survive on donations, so, which means government intervenes, and because of government intervention, we probably lose uh, efficiency of the system. And this is quite a sad situation because uh, the <clears throat> process of food, uh, supply food chain, it's not regulated by market or it's not regulated by, uh, let's say, uh, natural forces, but it's in, uh, regulated by government. And, um, and this is another aspect to all the issues which I think we have. Uh, and imagine if... Uh, producers, they receive a fair price of their products, you know, and if you compare in production, uh, uh, you know, so, sorry, in consumer basket, you see people pay, if you look at consumer basket, you know, somebody's paying for rent, you know, like 50 or 60 percent of their income, and for food, they're paying like 5, 10, and this creates, the food is the most essential item, you know, and if there is not enough money in the system of food production, because of these imbalances, it's difficult to discuss for any potential improvements. So, so this is kind of my, my, my view on this uh, point. Santosh, uh, are you there? Like, uh, on, my, on my side, uh, I would like to pass the word to, to uh, Santosh. Santosh said that he lost us. Ah, OK. Well. Uh... <laughs> oh, oh, okay, and and I think Patrick is here. Yeah, we go. I can see. Patrick. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. Hi, Frederick. Can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. 
Okay. For some reason, <coughs> I lost. Can you hear others. me? Uh, yes. I can hear you. Can you hear yes. others? Yes, I can hear everyone. Okay, it's just me then. For some reason, I lost others. So, um, Frederick, all of us. Good to have you. But <laughs> so let, me, let me see if I can reconnect. Uh, Frederick, we introduced ourselves and uh, shared our views on the uh, subject of the panel to start with. So may maybe you can continue while Sandra reconnect. Yes. Sure, I can introduce myself. Absolutely. So, Frederick de Mavius, I. Uh, run Planet First Partners. I founded and run Planet First Partners, an investment company that is focusing on better for you, better for the planet investments. Um, we're a growth investor, so we're investing in businesses that have already a proven technology and that need to scale up. And we fill a gap in the European market um, where uh, a lot of uh, VCs are naturally working in the sort of half a million to 10 million um, range of investment. And we invest in businesses that are between 10 and 30 million initial ticket and up to 50 million um, with follow-on investments. Um, it, when I say better for you, better for the planet. So we have also, we have investments. We will have investments that are both in sort of uh, sustainability, but also food and uh, healthy nutrition, always with a strong technology angle. Thank you, Frederick. Can you all hear me now? Yes. I, had, I had lost you all for a second, so I had to get out and get back in. Yeah, no worries. Uh, uh, so I appreciate, um, Frederick, and I'm glad to have you. I'm, I'm glad you were able to join us. Um, and thanks for the, the intro, everybody. Um, you know, what I would like to do now is maybe uh, start discussing a few few focus points. Um, you know, Dan, mm -hmm. you know, I know that uh, you're, you're involved in UN. I know you represent... One ag, uh, you know, one agrics, and you speak at many events. Can you talk about how you were able to use technology specifically to 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 address the challenges that one agrics was was uh, trying to tackle on? Yes. So when when I mentioned earlier about the five pillars of the food system, and um, just just for the benefit of the audience here, so I mentioned food safety, food security, food authenticity, food um, defense, and food security. Now. Now, what we are doing at One Agrix, what we have found, um, and what Constantine has said, that at the at the beginning of the food chain, we see that farmers are the the most exploited. We do see them not, um, you know, a lot of them are still earning under one dollar a day, and um, you know, the food that we are eating sometimes you know, it makes me feel guilty because you know, what are we eating? And and there's also child slavery, um, you know, um, in Africa, cocoa plantation. Um, uh, we, we, our team member actually spoke to people on the ground and it's still prevalent. Um, and, and, and so these are the, some, these are some issues that we have seen in the food chain. And how One Agrix is doing it is we're using technology to empower, um, so that there's less middlemen in between that cuts out the profit from, um, these farmers and how we do it, we leverage, um, a, 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 you know, a, a toolkit of technology. It can be blockchain, um, technology where what we do is we make sure that whatever that is being a process from farm to fork in that process, we can now, um, have certain data that there is being, um, transparent. Like for example, you know, is, is the, is the food from the farm, um, any child labor involved? That's one. Some data that we could we could we could get out of that, and basically, um, for example, what we can do is um, we can make them leverage technology on a platform in an e-commerce environment. Because when you look at the e-commerce environment now with agri-food, we see mostly big tier um, producers. We see bigger FMCG uh, manufacturers. We do not see SMEs. Or smallholder farmers. So one agrees what we did was we encourage, we work with um, ITC. I think I mentioned this before, International Trade Center, which is a mandate of UN and WTO. Um, the mandate for us is to empower the African continent. So we are starting now um, Nigerian back Nigeria um, government back Nigeria fits the world initiative. And what that initiative is really is to use um, a, a digital platform. I do not want to sell one agrees here, okay, Santosh. So is to use digital platform. To, um, to teach these smallholder farmers to sell directly. So when you sell directly, or when we, um, we, we, we build community leaders, 
basically you cut down at least 50% of the middlemen in between. And that means you give back the earnings back to the farmers. So that's what One Agrix is doing, um, at least that portion there. So yeah, Thank so I, I believe that the, the others to speak about you know, how technology plays a role. There's a wide scope that we cover, but that's one scope that I wanted to, to, to pick on um, what Constantine said about farmers not being able to earn Thank you. That's great. And I, I, I was, I was uh, listening to your video earlier of uh, someone, you know, talking about an orange yeah. uh, uh, passing through ten different companies before it reaches the consumer. And I'm like, well, that's amazing that it, from farm to, to to consumer, there are ten companies involved. We're buying and selling and buying and selling. It's like if we can eliminate that with with platforms like One Agrix, that's amazing because that means farmers are benefiting. So. Yeah. Thanks yes, and, and you have you have a lot of waste, of course, along the line. You you each time you have a a new uh, um, intermediary, you have waste at each level. So it's uh, we we invest a lot in in those chains and trying to reduce the uh, number of um, uh, of players. Um, technology plays a big role. Um, the mindset, of course, of um, of of the of the players is very important as well. And 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 so. We, we, we would typically invest in companies that have that type of impact and measured impact, which we will measure along the way and, and help um, uh, the CEOs of those businesses, founders, to really um, map the impact they will have along the way and to help them increasing that impact um, uh, on, the, on, the, on the continuous basis. Thank you, Frederick. Um, Natalia, I'm, I'm curious... If you could share, uh, I know you're you're very much interested in in encouraging you know women entrepreneurship in in this space. With that, think with I personally think is amazing. Can you can you share some success stories with us? Uh, sure. But let let me first address what Diana and Frederick uh, and Constantine said, uh, sharing their views because I think there there are very important points. So sure. one is price, and uh, we should mark the Food, inflate, food uh, products inflation, which we observed uh, during the pandemic. And I think that's one of the major learnings from the pandemic. Uh, it revealed the weaknesses of the global food chain, and it showed the inability to react to sudden large-scale disruptions on the one hand, and it also showed the consumer behavior, right, uh, as a reaction. So these kind of destructions, and 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 we still see the food prices inflations inflation in many countries. I absolutely agree that uh, the number of middlemen should be reduced in order to leave more value uh, for the uh, for the farmers and for the manufacturers. I would like to discuss how practical it is uh, to have technological solutions scaling uh, from the developed markets to the smaller emerging markets and how investors and impact investors can help to do it in comparison to the options when entrepreneurs uh, in the smaller local emerging markets find the sustainable solutions which serve their community. As a venture capitalist, I absolutely agree with Frederick that it's great to invest to the late stage companies uh, which need 50, 60 plus million to grow and then and they can scale. But operating from Russia and working a lot um, through Bright Ventures with entrepreneurs in Africa, entrepreneurs uh, in uh, Southeast Asia, entrepreneurs uh, in uh, CIS countries. I see that their markets are not big enough for the leading startups, late stage startups to enter the markets. But that does not mean that there is no problem, right? And that does not mean that uh, uh, these markets have not faced uh, the need to relocate the production to increase the supply of essential uh, goods, of essential food, right? It does not mean that there is no problem of uh, big data, this technology penetration, which is so much needed uh, through the whole value chain. And there are many entrepreneurs who can help farmers 
to adopt big data analysis technology to their daily work, uh, the entrepreneurs who, who can uh, teach them how and engage them to the um, marketplaces and uh, to uh, help optimize uh, the efficiency and uh, reduce the cost of operations and uh, learn how to produce more R&D-based nutritional food. And Santosh, back to your question. Uh, again, I think that women entrepreneurs can play a crucial role in uh, promoting technology and in starting the innovative companies. And we have good experience in different markets supporting the scale up from uh, the developed markets like US to the emerging markets. And what entrepreneurs and, uh, and uh, in our case, women entrepreneurs were looking for, they were looking for the strategic advice. They dare to get out uh, their comfort zone. Uh, they need help to review the business models, uh, to get an advice how to create a demand for the technology in, in the new markets, how to deal with the um, uh, international organizations like FAO or with EFAT to get support, right? Uh, how to pitch to them, how to approach them, how to start the collaborations. And um, uh, that's, that's one of the... Uh, jobs we do for them. We are connecting uh, women entrepreneurs to the networks they need, providing coaching and providing access to the resources. And I think it's really market by market to see uh, who can contribute to fixing the, uh, the food chain problems. Smaller startups, bigger international startups in collaboration with corporations and in collaboration with governments. Thank you. Um, you know, <clears throat> one of the things that um, I, I know, Constantine, you have a background in, in finance and economy. Um, it, it, the question that you asked is very relevant. How do we create a, a circular economy where farmers benefit the most, uh, even from actions like carbon offsetting, or now it's being referred to as carbon insetting, a new model? Um, but how can the, the big retailers you know, push the rewards back to farmers and at the same time change the consumer behavior? Um, it's, 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 it's about changing the behaviors, right behaviors across the stakeholders to create the proper economic cycle that benefits key, key, key stakeholders like farmers. Do you want to share your thoughts on, on, on how, to, how to go about increasing the benefits to farmers? Uh, th thank you, Santosh. And, and this is indeed a very interesting question, but uh, look at the irony of this question. So we all, you know, very nice guys and girls discussing the food chain, but no, nobody from us is a farmer. Yeah. And we are saying, hey, oh, <laughs> I, I, I am too. <laughs> how, how big a farmer you are, you know, like, but even, you know, if, even if you are a farmer, probably you removed your farmer head out of this discussion and you, you are this discussion more as an entrepreneur or consultant or, you know, thought leader. So for me, the, the issue, you know, is the kind of being a farmer is not, is not cool, yeah, like, uh, in, in modern society. You know, like, uh, when you go and see, like, panels, meetings, see how many farmers there are, like, you know, and we are trying to resolve their issue without even asking them, hey, guys, what are your issues? You know, like, and, uh, you know, look at the younger generation, you know, like, and generation, you know, like, generation Z, generation X, you know, like, how many of these guys, they want to become farmers? And, you know, and this is, like, a huge imbalances in our society where, you know, we, like, cutting off our most basic supply and, you know, like, and... Uh, leaving this, these people out of the discussion and out of the ecosystem, almost, yeah? Of course, you know, there are some discussion, there are some farmer associations and so forth, but, you know, still the gap between uh, retailers, middlemen, and technology is huge. And we're still not addressing, you know, the, the, you know, the beginning of, of the food chain. And for me, this is the biggest issue. And, of course, you know, when we're speaking, I also would like to address, you know, Natalia and Diana issues about food infla inflation. For me, food inflation happened, I know, five or ten years ago when we started introducing the concept of organic food. Yeah? 
go to organic shops in the United States and compare this to the mainstream food price in you know, Walmart, Target, or any other market. Like the price there, like three, four, five times bigger. And this creates like a big differentiation. And you know, and if you would like to buy a quality food where you 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 know and probably more money distributed to the farmers and producers, the prices are much, much more higher. And so this is a little bit more like hypocrisy of the markets, you know, where we have kind of, you know, food for everybody and we have food for people who are ready to pay more for the food. And, you know, and these imbalances, they, they cannot be fixed. Of course, you know, there are some help, you know, from technology and, and entrepreneurs being in the sector. But before, before it's addressed on a social level, on a social paradigm level, I think we will be facing more and more issues in the future. Yeah. If I may, if I may respond to to, sure. to those to two of the points there, which I think are, are really relevant, um, I think one issue that the farmers have not really been able to benefit from is is carbon offset programs or carbon programs to become carbon farmers um, and to um, basically derive an additional income from uh, good practices and carbon trapping. And there are great opportunities for carbon trapping at the level of the of the farm. Um, and your, your point about um, and, and we're seeing it and we see in the number of initiatives in Europe that are starting uh, also in the US with regenerative farming and uh, the ability to, um, to to start pooling certain farmers and having companies pay for um, the, the new practices, which is which is a positive for for young farmers as well. I think your, your point about organic farming is a very good one. Um, it's, it's actually um, the farmer only gets maybe 15 or 20 percent, let's say a little more, maybe, maybe 30 percent more for its um, produce than a traditional produce. Um, retail makes this um, sort of multiply two or three times. So, so, that the, so when as a buyer you are or as a purchaser you're in, in the store, of course, it's a lot more expensive. But there is indeed a yield difference between traditional and uh, and organic farming. Uh, I don't think organic farming is 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 the solution for for the world. And we're talking about um, the food chain here, but we should also talk about the carbon chain. And I think if the farmers can become big players in uh, the carbon chain, they will be. Um, I mean, their, their their standards are going to go up again, and they will be better producers. The, 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 the additional point I would make is that farmland is only used for up to, um, I think it's, it's less than 30% for human consumption. Most, the rest is going for animal consumption and or uh, biodiesel. Um, that is insane. Uh, that, that doesn't make sense. We, we should be produ- farmers should be producing food. They shouldn't be, well, food directed food for the consumer. They shouldn't be producing biodiesel and, and making the the, the, the um, activity and the, the price of land go up without nourishing uh, the populations. That's a great point, actually, Frederick. Um, do you do you think that I know that there are, there are a couple of trends that are emerging in the recent past? One is going local. Um, you know, that's obviously COVID forced that to, to a large extent. But is it possible? to actually go local all the way? That's one question. Second question is, is vertical farming uh, an option here and a solution for especially for urban um, cities and, and for, for the food, food needs there? So any takers, anybody can go. Yes, on, on urban farming, uh, v- v- you know, very interesting debate. Um, I mean, the, the, the varieties that are grown in, in urban farms are essentially replacing smallhold farmers, uh, fruit and veg smallhold farmers. They represent, you know, less than 10%, maybe 5% of the land use. Uh, they usually, um, the, the urban farms are going for the most profitable crops, strawberries, um, uh, you know, all, all the very profitable crops, um, because they need a lot of, um, of, of manual uh, work. Um, and I think it's, it's really not a solution for, uh, okay, it's less water consumption, um, less pesticides, herbicides for a product that is grown in a, in a substrate that is totally, um, uh, I would say, 
void of any life, um, but it produces, it, it's a produce, okay. Um, it, it doesn't deal with a lot of the farmland that, that is available, and I'm not sure that it addresses um, anywhere near a, a world problem. It, it addresses, yes, a local, a localized uh, solution, um, but it doesn't address, um, I think, uh, hunger in the world in any way. May be useful for certain countries where there is only sun and 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 no soil. So definitely, there are countries there where, which which is an opportunity to provide uh, fruit and veg, uh, particularly vegetables uh, and salads um, in countries like the Middle East, um, where where the, it, it, it's a rich country with um, you know importing salads from the rest of the world doesn't make sense. Of course, that is great, but I think it will remain a fringe of um, of the food chain. Thank I you. will point, Frederick, uh, that uh, vertical farming is uh, a nice value-adding proposition, but for very few developed markets. And it, it may become more important and more viable and more demanded uh, with uh, the growth of urbanization, but uh, I think we still need to look market by market and uh, on how the science transform on how the science is transforming the food chain and food manufacturing i'm thinking about alternative proteins uh, as a, a way to give uh, more nutritional products and that's a way to solve the problem with uh, uh, unequal use uh, of the land for um, human consumption and for, for the animal and for the biofuels. And again, back to the technology, right? And um, to the education of the people in developing markets and developed markets to work more and to help to disseminate those technologies. And I also believe that uh, the solutions are required to increase lead time, transparency, Cost optimization throughout the whole chain, right? And here only the technology at this moment can help. And also we need to ensure that smaller markets communicate between themselves and that uh, small and medium businesses, they adapt the technologies, that they have change advocates who help them to adapt. But back to Constantine's point, who is talking to farmers, right? Otherwise, at some point of time, they will start losing profits and they will go bankrupt and uh, we will stay with uh, vulnerable, uh, global only uh, food chains, which uh, will not again be able to react to the sudden disruptions. So, so um, I would like to add that, you know, if you look at the, the whether we have enough food in the world, the answer is yes. And um, why, I, why I say this is a distribution and resilience issue. So we have a food resilience issue here where you see this connected, how farmers, SMEs and, and the MNCs, how they are connected in the, the, the global food chain is very disconnected not resilient at all. Um, and, and, and when COVID-19 happened, you could see, um, you know, in, in the food chain where big uh, manufacturers rely on smallholder farmers to supply them, but then smallholder farmers get cut, cut out in terms of transport, transport, transportation, in terms of logistics. So how do you solve that? You know, well, technology is one, but it's also behavior, um, you know, regulations, um, behavior, um, of, 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 um, you know, of societies and communities during that pandemic. So there's many, um, things that we need to keep in consideration, but that just now, Santos, you were, you were talking about whether going local will solve, um, you know, world's hunger, for example. The answer is no. And, um, in, in fact, to empower economies, trade needs to happen, commerce needs to happen between um, countries. And what, what we see here is empowering SMEs to trade. So what, what, what we've, we've been seeing, oh, okay, there's not enough food, is because more, when it comes to global trade, it has always been with the big boys only, but there's so many SMEs. So just now, Constantine, you were saying that who's speaking to the farmers? So um, for, for myself and my team, what we do is we speak directly to the farmers. So with our ITC partnership, um, what we did was we were, we had the privilege of, of visiting um, African Union Commission. There was a trade um, summit. We spoke to farmers. 
um, from numerous parts of Africa. And these honest farmers, they they are they are they really want to trade. They want to go global, but they say we do not have that government support. Unfortunately, we do not have that that um, technology support. But now we see things changing with the AFCFTA. We see things changing. We see that those countries, for example, Nigeria, it can truly feed itself. What help do they need? Support from the government, support from entrepreneurs, like what Natalia said. So what if we have technology, right? Who's going to help them? Um, can we really disrupt the middleman? The answer is yes, we can, but we still need community leaders to teach them, okay, upload your product for the platform. Um, this is how you price your products. So really, this is this is what I'm trying to say. So alternative protein, Natalia, can be one, but at the same time, solve the current issue when we have food, but it's not distributed equally. That is the, the, the issue we need to solve. Agree, fully agree. Uh, I, I would like to, to add something on, on these points. Like for me, you know, technology is good, you know, and, uh, you know, bringing technology to farmers is amazing, you know, <clears throat> but the issue which I see, you know, like if you look at traditional farm and you look at the, at the agriculture, a way as people from, let's say, technology or entrepreneurial um, side, we really don't understand the essence of it. Because farm is usually a closed system, you know, and we have like, you know, like systems like, uh, you know, bio and then we have biodynamic, you know, when actually, you know, like everything in the farm needs to be rotated, which means it's uh, it's very counterproductive, for example, to say, hey, farmer, if you grow, for example, you know, corn, it's the most profitable, forget about everything else, forget about animals and, and everything. So farm is closed system, it should have animals, it should have uh, corn, it should have circulation of manure and so forth. And for me, the question of when we start bringing technology, start bringing money to the system, how we can preserve this closed ecosystem of the farm in order to be effective and gentle to earth and gentle to the products per se. And for me, this industrialization and too much technology in the farm creates this possible threat where, again, we go almost like plastic food and we'll be focused on profit, we'll distribute, redistribute it a little bit, but we'll lose a lot of quality. Thank yes. you. And, and, and an impoverishment of the soils. Um, I, I would like to, to stress this really. Um, soils have been run down uh, for the last 40 or 50 years with uh, deep tilling um, and, and no respect for biodiversity. Uh, we've seen a fall in biodiversity in, 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 the, in the plains um, coming from a loss of, of microbiological uh, life in the soils. And therefore, the yields are going down you know, more and more and, 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 and have to be bolstered more and more by, by chemical fertilizers. So... Um, we, we, I think when you say a closed system, yes, it's a closed system, but it's a closed system that should reincorporate, as you say, animals for biodiversity and for uh, the soil. And if you can't re reinstate animals, it's, it's basically practices that are carbon positive and that are carbon trapping. And I think we need to get the farming community and agriculture be part of the carbon issue and that will also help them financially, but it will help us uh, on the planet as well. And uh, I would like to respond to Constantine that you are absolutely right. If the purpose of technology is only to generate returns to the venture funds, then yes, it, it can exhaust farmers and don't uh, bring sustainable value. But uh, if so, it's very important that investors um, send the right set the right expectations for the entrepreneurs who are um, helping farmers adopt the technologies. And uh, the objectives should not be only financial, but also the ESG objectives uh, and uh, the stakeholders' interests and uh, the equal distribution goals and uh, the uh, community, community development and community Population is projected to reach 9.8 billion in by 2050 and 11.2 billion by 2100. How do you think food and water access should be managed and how to ensure equal distribution? That's a big question, though. <laughs> it's a big question. 
Any takers? I think Diana should take it. Yeah. I saw, I saw. <laughs> oh, oh, man. <laughs> we're, we're all appointing you, Diana. <laughs> okay, so um, so how do you think food and water access should be managed and how to ensure equal distribution? Well, this is where you need to empower communities. Again, it comes back to the question of empowering communities and look at the, each country and the food um, supply that they have. From there, I, I believe that um, it's not just the owner. So private-public partnerships, we are big on that. That is very, very important. I mean, we can't solve um, the, the, the world's food and water access issue without collaboration of all these partners. And why, why I say this is because, as I said, why we are having a food resilience issue is because the food the, the world is so reliant on big producers and big FMCG companies distributing food. But the small holder farmers, the SMEs, are able to give that access, I mean, that a quantity. And from there, how is it equally distributed? Then I would say that it is the onus on regulations, on governments to make sure that happens. And, and I'm not a politician. I, I don't run a government. So that I would leave that um, to, you know, distribution issue on making it equal, the onus of governments. However, governments. however I do know that communities can also assure equal distribution. You have a food a bank, for example, and you could do the equal distribution between between communities. So there are two ways that you can you can look at and look at it. One is at the macro level where governments can help with distribution, and the other at the micro level where communities you nominate community leaders to also help with food distribution. And also transparent tracing. And yeah, the traceability and transparency. Again, it's not, not enough time, Natalia. I would love to talk about traceability to the cows couple, but seriously, yeah. I think I think we we're already past our time, so um, let's let's uh, pause here. Anyway, um, I wish I'm sure we can continue like this for hours, um, and this has really been in you know, a very insightful conversation. So thank you so much for for joining us, and thank you for. Um, I think we have more questions coming. Looks like, but uh, I don't think we'll have time, so we'll have to.